It's the moment you've been waiting for. Dessert. Will it be the creme brulee, or the fruit tart, or the crumbly peach cobbler, or a piece of flowerless chocolate cake, or maybe one of each? What is it about sugary foods that creates such a craving? When you take a bite of something sweet, what happens next? Well, for most people, the next thing that happens is another bite. It's addictive. The average American consumes 32 teaspoons of sugar a day. But these seemingly harmless white granules deliver more than just sweetness. They're also responsible for a lot of health problems. One that affects increasing numbers of people in the United States is diabetes. But how do we get from a soda and a few donuts to a disease that affects 15 million Americans and kills 70,000 people a year? I'm Dr. Keller Wortham, sugar and diabetes, as well as a quick peek at why we sweat and what makes it smell so bad, and what really happens to your skin when you get a sunburn. All of this on today's edition of What Happens Next. Sugar, give it to me. In a sense, you could say that need for sugar runs in our blood. Humans are born preferring sweet over sour. Our brain has specific reward pathways that light up like crazy when we get something sweet. They're the same pathways that are triggered by heroin or cocaine or even sex. You can't fight that. Then that's okay. It's okay to want sugar. As humans, we need sugar to survive. So don't avoid it. Not that you could if you wanted to, because sugar is found almost everywhere. It's found naturally in fruits, vegetables, and nectars. And where it's not found, we add it. It's in your ketchup, your cereal, your soup, your salad dressing, your peanut butter, your pancake syrup, your bread, your yogurt, you name it, it probably has sugar in it. They even put sugar in your salt. Well, there are different types of sugar, but those familiar little white crystals are technically known as sucrose. Sucrose is composed of two simple sugar units, glucose and fructose. White sugar comes from sugar cane or sugar beets. The sugar is extracted and then washed and purified to separate the pure sucrose from the plant material. It can then be used as granules or compressed into cubes or pulverized into powdered sugar. So, whether as little white granules dissolved in iced tea or in a candy bar, when you eat sugar, what happens next? The body breaks down carbohydrates into a simple sugar called glucose. This form of ready energy is absorbed into the blood where it's delivered to every cell. It may be used immediately as energy for the body and brain, or brought to the liver to be stored as glycogen for later use. When the physician says, I want to have your blood sugar taken, he's actually measuring glucose, the amount of glucose that is in circulation. So when we consume table sugar, we're actually consuming two kinds of sugars, one being fructose and one being glucose. Our body needs a constant and dependable supply of glucose, so it's devised a number of systems to ensure this supply. The main way is by means of insulin, a hormone continually secreted by the pancreas that regulates the amount of glucose in the blood. Insulin helps bring glucose into the cells of the body, and it also helps store excess glucose in the liver. These reserves can be used to boost glucose levels if they start to decrease. Okay, so you want sugar, you need sugar, but sometimes your body stops being able to process all the sugar that you take in, and so your blood sugar levels go skyrocketing. What happens next? Well, we'll find out right after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. So, you've all heard the term sugar rush. Well, have you ever wondered why the energy boost doesn't last longer? Sugar gives you a quick burst of energy as it's absorbed into the bloodstream and picked up by your brain. But the pancreas immediately releases a rush of insulin, 
which rapidly lowers the blood sugar and causes a significant drop in energy and endurance. The sugar crash. Our blood sugar will shoot up for the first few hours after meal and it will slowly decay within about four to six hours to a normal level. That is perfectly normal. It says that our bodies are reacting appropriately in response to what you and I consume on a regular basis. It's when that glucose goes up and stays up that can lead to some clinical symptoms and really serious health issues. When your blood glucose level stays elevated, you may have any of a number of symptoms, including frequent urination, thirst, dry mouth, blurry vision, fatigue, drowsiness, and unexplained weight loss. These can all be signs of an underlying disease, one we've all heard of, diabetes. Well, a combined 60 million Americans have diabetes or are at risk for developing it. Diabetes is a disease that's caused by your inability to regulate sugar. And specifically, it's caused by one of two things, either a loss of your ability to, to produce the hormone insulin or a loss of your, the ability of your body to respond to insulin. What the hormone insulin does is to allow you to take sugar up from your food and put it inside cells where you need it to serve as a source of energy. So when you lose the cells in your pancreas that produce insulin or it stops working, you can eat sugar and it enters your bloodstream, but it can't enter the cells where it's needed to be used as energy. Let me try and explain further. See, there are proteins on the surface of cells that sugar latches onto, so it can be transported inside of the cells. Sugar can't move into the cells on its own. You need specific transporters on the surface of cells that can shuttle the sugar inside the cells where it's used for energy. This is where insulin comes in. I went into the doctor and we had some tests run and found out my blood sugar was running almost 600, which is very close to comatose. And uh, we started the insulin treatment immediately. What insulin does is put those transporters on the surface of the cells where they can grab the sugar and move it inside. Some of the symptoms of diabetes come from there being too much sugar in your circulation. It rises because you can't literally put it into cells. And when you have so much sugar to be removed in the kidneys, water has to follow along with it and you wind up having to urinate a lot. And people almost always first notice both that they are feeling really fatigued and have no energy because they can't use sugar as an energy source, but also that they are drinking a lot and urinating a lot. We'll get into different types of diabetes later in the show, but first, let's take a quick look at another way your body gets rid of fluids. Uh, when I'm sweating, my skin feels really warm and uh, wet. I hate it when I have to go straight to class after I've been sweating all day. Some people are just kind of clammy, you know, they, they sit around and, and they sweat and, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing, but I, I, I can see why that would be inconvenient. Sweat, which your body's way of cooling itself and removing that extra heat that can come from hardworking muscles or overstimulated nerves. The average person has 2.6 million sweat glands in their skin, which are distributed over the entire body. The sweat gland is a long, coiled, hollow tube of cells. The coiled part in the dermis is where sweat is produced, and the long portion is a duct that connects the gland to the opening or pore on the skin's outer surface. When the sweat gland is stimulated, it secretes a fluid that is similar to plasma. This fluid travels from the coiled portion up through the straight duct. Sweat produced in special apocrine sweat glands, like under your arms, is a bit different because it also contains proteins and fatty acids, which make it thicker and give it a milkier or yellowish color. This is why underarm stains and clothing appear yellowish. Okay, but why does it stink? Well, sweat itself is odorless. It's actually the bacteria that live on the skin and break down the sweat that cause that unpleasant odor. Now, if you have chronic excessive sweating, it could be a sign of other medical conditions such as thyroid problems, low blood sugar levels, or a nervous system disorder. More uh, what happens next. Next.
So earlier in our show, we found out that diabetes is a disorder that involves insulin, the hormone that allows sugar to enter the cells and be converted into energy. Now we're going to talk about the two types of diabetes. The first is type 1 also called insulin-dependent diabetes or juvenile diabetes. It's one of the most common childhood diseases, but it can occur at any age. One form of diabetes occurs when the cells that produce insulin in your pancreas just die. This is called type 1 diabetes or juvenile onset diabetes because people usually develop the symptoms of diabetes in childhood. What we think has happened there is that there has been some insult, we're not sure what, whether it's an infection, a chemical exposure, or what exactly happens, but it triggers the death of the cells in your pancreas that produce insulin. You don't even know it's happening until it's about 80% gone. Unfortunately, by the time you have the very first symptoms, those cells in your pancreas are mostly gone. Now, the treatment for type 1 diabetes is simple but it's not so convenient. You give people back the insulin that their bodies can't produce. However, you can't simply give them a pill that has insulin in it. You have to inject insulin. It's a big protein. You can't take a pill because your stomach would degrade it. So people have to give themselves shots through the day to provide the insulin that their pancreas would normally produce. And the other hard part about treating that kind of diabetes is that it's very hard for us to produce the pattern of insulin in the blood that your pancreas does. Your pancreas just is exquisite. The second and most common type of diabetes is type 2, or non-insulin dependent diabetes. When you hear of adults having diabetes, this is usually the type they're talking about. It's often, but not always, associated with obesity, particularly around the abdomen or the upper body it's responsible for 85 to 90 percent of all diabetes. When people become really overweight and they gain a certain amount of body fat, it triggers a whole complicated cascade of effects that make that receptor protein that insulin binds to not work anymore. And you lose the cascade. In other words, your pancreas can make insulin, but it has to release extra to try and compensate for the fact that the receptors aren't recognizing it. The result is a vicious cycle where insulin isn't working and your pancreas just keeps trying by releasing more. Well, this can eventually burn out your pancreas, making the situation even worse. In the meantime, the high sugar levels are wreaking havoc on the rest of your body. Diabetes is a very profound and very pervasive disease. And it's one which really can't be treated as a unique or discrete entity. It's really a whole spectrum of diseases. The one thing that you can generalize about diabetes is that it is a vascular disease more than anything else. If you leave diabetes untreated, it can cause long-term damage to just about any part of the body. Think about it. Our body can no longer process sugar. Because of this, the most fundamental source of energy in our bodies reaches toxic levels. It can lead to kidney damage, eye damage, nerve damage, heart disease, circulation problems, impotence, and stroke. The results are devastating. It may cause ultimately kidney failure because of the damage to the capillary beds in the kidneys. It may cause blindness because of the consequences at the retinal vessels. Sugar will actually prevent our own defenses from attacking and clearing bacterial invasion. This is because high blood sugar suppresses the immune system. It depletes levels of white blood cells that are needed for strong immune function. This reduces the ability to fight infection and disease. Now, if high blood sugar weren't enough, there's another danger lurking here too. If you take insulin or insulin stimulating pills for your type 2 diabetes, your blood glucose may sometimes fall too low. This condition is known as hypoglycemia. 
It can happen when there's more insulin in your body than you need at that time. When this happens, you may have any of a number of symptoms. Sweating, trembling, feeling anxious, turning pale, and heart palpitations. You often will see this in individuals who are on a long-term fast or a low-fat diet. They develop a condition called ketosis. As your blood glucose level keeps falling, your brain is deprived of the glucose it needs to function. You may experience difficulty concentrating, feeling disoriented, acting out of character, being aggressive, being uncooperative, blurred vision, and headache. The brain is not using sugar because it doesn't have anything available, so it starts metabolizing the fat in your brain. It starts metabolizing fat in other parts of your body. The brain is not happy about using ketone bodies uh, for energy, so you become disoriented many times. There are two stages to treating hypoglycemia. First, you have to get some sugar in your body quickly, so drink some juice or eat a piece of fruit. And then, eat a more substantial carbohydrate-containing food to prevent your blood sugar from falling again. Diabetes affects many aspects of our day-to-day -day life, from working to driving, going on vacation to having sex. In all these instances, being informed, taking care of your body, and planning ahead will help prevent these problems. <laughs> Do you want to lose weight? Reduce your risk of diabetes? Well, the answer, friends, is simpler than you might imagine. Try this two-step program. Step one, a moderate exercise program undertaken on a regular basis can help you maintain appropriate body weight and muscle tone. Step two, eat a heart-healthy diet full of fresh fruits and vegetables. So what are you waiting for? Get fit today. A number of things are factors with a type 2 diabetes in terms of lifestyle. Um, I look at complementary therapies or integrative uh, medicine therapies such as breathing techniques, as such as acupuncture, such as stretching, such as yoga, uh, certainly activity in the form of walking, activity in the form of relaxing, sleeping, getting a massage. All of these things are very helpful because what they're going to do is reduce stress and put stress in its proper relationship in the body with relaxation and just stasis. When we come back, I'll discuss other things you can do to manage your sugar intake. And later, we'll talk about what happens when you don't manage your sun intake. Stay tuned. More What Happens Next, coming right up. Welcome back. Refined sugar. By some, it's considered a drug because in the refining process, everything of food value has been removed, except for the carbohydrate pure calories. There are no vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats, enzymes, or any of the other elements that make up food. In the typical American diet today, which is composed of about 45% carbohydrates, 20% protein, and 30 to 35% fat, sugars account for about 21% of the total daily caloric intake. Reports estimate that sugars added to food account for 11% of calories consumed. There aren't any good or bad foods, only good or bad diets. If half your diet is pure sugar, of course that isn't healthy. But in a normal, varied diet, there are no adverse effects of sugar itself. There are plenty of ways to help you kick the sugar habit. First, you have to limit your sugar intake, avoiding sugary foods and not adding it to others. Use alternative whole food snacks such as fruit, dates, and whole grain crackers in the place of sweets. It'll be hard at first because your body will want sugar, but that burning desire to get more sweets will decrease with time. Like many addictions, the first week is the hardest. Exercising will help reduce cravings, and taking L-glutamine and chromium supplements is helpful as well. Keep healthy snacks on hand for when you get those sudden urges. Most of all, be patient and forgiving of yourself. It will take time to be successful, but you can do it. Now, here's something else we can shed a little bit of light on. Music 
you are a lobster. Sure, you may look good in a few days if you're one of those lucky ones whose sunburns miraculously turn to tan. But when you get a sunburn, what are you really getting? You're getting cellular damage from ultraviolet radiation. This UV radiation actually damages the components and DNA of the skin cells. The body responds to the damage with increased blood flow to the capillary bed of the dermis in order to bring in materials to repair the damage. The extra blood in the capillaries causes the redness. If you press on sunburned skin, it will turn white as the blood is pushed away and then return to red as the capillaries refill. Damage to the nerve fibers in your skin causes the pain which is typically proportional to the duration and intensity of the exposure. Sunburns occur when UV radiation exceeds the protective capacity of melanin in the skin. When you get a tan, what is actually happening is that special melanocytes deep in the skin are producing melanin pigment in reaction to ultraviolet waves in the sunlight. The pigment then travels to the surface, where it has a protective effect of absorbing the UV radiation and sunlight before it damages the cells. It's important to know that the fake pigment you can get from artificial tanners does not offer the same protection as melanin. So all you orange gods and goddesses, beware. A sunburn can be life-threatening and can eventually lead to skin cancer if the cells do not repair the UV damage completely. Skin cancer is one of the leading cancers in America. Well, sunburns can easily be prevented by using sunscreen, clothing, and hats, and limiting sun exposure, especially during the middle of the day. The only cure for sunburn is slow healing, although aloe and skin creams with anesthetic can help. Well, that's our show. Join us next time for another edition of What Happens Next. I'm Dr. Keller Wortham saying, know how your body works. See you next time. <laughs>